Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Silkman and in today's presentation I'm going to be examining the following. How a bullet fragment with Teresa Horbuck's DNA, also known as item FL, was discovered in Stephen Avery's garage. In today's presentation I'm going to be focusing and examining the key roles of Dr. Leslie Eisenberg, Brendan Dassey, and Cherie Cohane. Now, on Thursday, November the 10th, Dr. Eisenberg, who is a forensic anthropologist, she had received a box of bones. She described the bones as being blackened, highly fragmented, and incomplete human bone fragments. It is important to note that this box of bones was given evidence tag 8318. All these bones apparently were found in the Stephen Avery burn pit. Note, Dr. Eisenberg was not the first forensic anthropologist to examine these bones. These bones were actually observed on the Tuesday, November the 8th, by Dr. Ken Bennett, who was also a, a forensic anthropologist. He had examined the ilium bone, shown here in the diagram, and the ilium bone is the uppermost bone of the pelvis, and he found this in evidence tag 8318. Upon examination, Dr. Bennett had concluded that the ilium bone was from an adult human female. Now what is interesting here is that additional burnt pelvic bone fragments that had cut marks were found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit and these were given evidence tag 8675. Now, these additional pelvic bone fragments, they were examined by Dr. Eisenberg. She stated that they were suspected possible human. So what we have here is a very interesting and bizarre situation, whereby we have pelvic bone fragments that have all been burnt to the same degree in two entirely separate locations. Now, Dr. Eisenberg had examined the human cremains and she wrote a report. And it's worth reading the finding of her report. Quote, this forensic anthropological examination and laboratory analysis has identified the burned and extremely fragmented human remains as those of an adult female less than 30 to 35 years of age. It is not possible to estimate stature or determine ancestry given the bone fragmentation and destruction due to the burning episode. A deliberate attempt was made to obscure the identity of the victim as well as the cause and manner of death through burning. Evidence for two high-velocity gunshot wounds to the head has been documented. There are cuts to a minimum of two areas of pelvic bone that may be of human origin. Additionally, a possible human calcine long bone fragment with hesitation cut marks and a sore kerf mark has been recognized as have other undiagnostic cut bone fragments that may be of human origin. This young adult female should be considered a victim of homicidal violence with possible evidence for post-mortem processing of portions of the body to facilitate disposal. Let me just reflect on that. There is no question about it that Teresa Holbach had suffered a horrendous death. There appears to have been two gunshot wounds to the head, 
Her bones had saw cuts in them. Her body likely was cut up and cremated. But not only that, after cremation, it appears that the bones were crunched and all the bones that were recovered were very, very small and highly fragmented. Clearly, the killer or killers did not want the identity of the victim to be known. But for the purposes of this presentation, this is what I would like to highlight. And that Dr. Eisenberg stated that there was evidence for two high velocity gunshot wounds to the head. Dr. Eisenberg had examined both the parietal and occipital cranial bone fragments. And when she examined these cranial bone fragments, as you can see here, uh, where the parietal bone is and the occipital bone on a human skull, she noted the presence of defects, internal beveling, and when these fragments were x-rayed, the presence of radiopaque particles. Now we know that when a bullet strikes skull bone, the entry point, the hole that is created by when a bullet hits the skull bone, is relatively small compared to the much larger cavity that's formed on the inside of the skull. This is known as beveling. And one of the cranial fragments shown here, you can see that it's heavily burnt. There is evidence of a bevel. So this shows the inside of the skull, of the skull fragment. Now, the cranial bone fragments on November the 17th were x-rayed. I'm just going to read out what the findings were. As a result of those x-rays, several of the cranial fragments, at least seven of them, showed evidence for areas with a greater density than the bone itself. In other words, they were small, tiny areas, almost flecks, that appeared whiter in the x-ray than the surrounding bone. And you can see here uh, an example of one of the x-rayed uh, cranial bone fragments. And when Kenneth Olsen examined uh, these fragments, he found the presence of lead. And he concluded that a potential source of that lead would be a bullet. So let's summarize the gunshot wounds that were noted to the skull. The cranial bone fragments were x-rayed and they showed radio park signatures. They came up as tiny white flecks. The parietal bone fragment in the left temple area showed the presence of an internal bevel. The occipital bone fragment, which is at the back of your skull, and in this particular case, left of the midline, also showed an internal bevel. And we can summarize the wounds on a skeletal model. So here you can see the parietal defect near the temple. And here you can see the occipital defect near the back of the skull. So we know that Teresa was shot at least twice in the skull. I want you to note though that less than 25% of the skull was recovered and the fragments that were recovered were heavily fragmented and extremely burnt. Now, a rifle was recovered from Stephen Avery's bedroom. It was a Glenfield Model 60 semi-automatic rifle and it was found above the headboard of his bed and you can see that in the diagram over here and here is a picture of the rifle it was seized on november the 6th and the owner the actual owner of the rifle was roland johnson the key question we need to ask here was this rifle the murder weapon but note 
if Stephen Avery had indeed committed this crime, he clearly made no attempt at all to hide the so-called murder weapon. It was still found hanging in his bedroom in the rack. Now, let's have a look at the role that Brendan played and how Brendan's confession, so-called confession, eventually led to the discovery of item FL. Now, of course, Brendan had undergone many interviews or interrogations, and the lead investigators, Fassbender and Wiegert, they would have already known from Dr. Leslie Eisenberg's report that Teresa Halbach had been shot in the head at least twice. Now, when you think about it, only the killer or someone at the murder scene would have known this. And of course, once Brendan had confessed, the day after we have that infamous press conference. Now, what is important to note is that Brendan had never mentioned anything about the shooting of Teresa until investigator Wiegert had directly asked him about it on the 1st of March, when he stated, who shot her in the head? Of course, all this information was used in the press conference on March the 2nd. Now, note, there were no bullet fragments found at this stage of the murder investigation, before Brendan's confession, despite the many extensive and multiple searching of Stephen Avery's trailer and garage, and I believe Stephen's trailer was searched at least five times. Now, something curious happened. It actually was Special Agent Fassbender who mentions a gun for the very first time. Let's examine the testimony here. We get, uh, this occurred on February the 27th. We get, I have to ask you another difficult question. It's very important that you to be honest with me, okay? Did you have anything to do with the death of Teresa Holbach? Brendan, no. Wiegert, tell me who did. Brendan, Steve. Wiegert, and Steve did it by how again? Tell me that again. Brendan, that he stabbed her. So clearly, the cause of death was that Teresa was stabbed by Stephen Avery. Fassbender, okay, had he told you that? Yes or no? Brendan, yes. Now watch what Fassbender does. Did he say he had had a gun with a uh, at all? Look at Wiget's response. Did you ask him about a gun? Wiget, he changed Attacked immediately and he told you that he did this in her truck obviously referring to the stabbing Brendan yeah all right so Brendan underwent another interrogation session and this is where we get mentions about who shot her in the head so let's continue with this interrogation which took place on March the 1st. We get, so Steve stabs her first and then you cut her neck. Brendan nods, yes. What else happens to her in her head? So note, it's we get that keeps on mentioning the head. Fassbender, it's extremely, extremely important. You tell us this for us to believe you. We get, come on, Brendan, what else? Fassbender, we know, we just need you to tell us. Brendan, that's all I can remember. We get, all right, I'm just going to come out and ask you, who shot her in the head? Brendan, he did. Fassbender, then why didn't you tell us that? Have a look at Brendan's response. Because I couldn't think of it. Now, clearly, at this stage, I cannot believe that both Wiget and Fassbender simply didn't tear up their notes and walk out. 
because Brendan was simply echoing back the information that they were feeding to him. But they continued, Fassbender, tell us where she was shot. Brendan, in the head. Fassbender, no, I mean where? In the garage? Now note, Fassbender is the one that mentions the garage. Brendan, oh? Fassbender, outside, in the house? Brendan, in the garage? Fassbender, okay. So let's summarize this. It was, in fact, both investigators who had first mentioned the shooting in the head as well as the garage, not Brendan. So this information about the shooting incident, the location, in fact, came from the investigators themselves. Now, of course, once this information was gathered from Brendan, a new search warrant was obtained. And notice what Wiget says uh, when questioned. He goes, yes, we had developed new information on the case and we acted on that information. Of course, the new information did not come from Brendan, but it actually came from the investigators themselves. So a new search warrant was issued to research uh, Brendan's trailer and also the garage. And of course, with this new information, a press conference was uh, called on March the 2nd. And this is where uh, uh, Attorney Kratz uh, basically outlined how the murder took place basically everyone in the county would have known this information and hence potentially polluting any form of a fair trial. Now two bullet fragments were found in Stephen Avery's garage. So we have an example of one of those bullet fragments and that was known as item FL and that was found on March the 2nd. There was another additional bullet fragment, also known as item FK. So these two uh, new uh, discoveries were found on March the 2nd in Stephen Avery's garage. But the question must be asked, how come the investigators had missed these two bullet fragments even after five searches of the Stephen Avery's garage? In part two of my presentation, I'd like to have a look at the role that Cherie Colhane played in the analysis of item FL. And Cherie, of course, was the head of the DNA unit at the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory. It is important, however, before we dive into this, that we understand what the polymerase chain reaction is all about. We need to have a look at contamination issues of both test and control samples. We need to ask why Fassbender placed pressure on Colhane very early on in the case. We need to have a look at the critical importance of PCR controls. Next, we're going to examine what actually went wrong in the analysis of item FL. And finally, we'll have a look at the Wisconsin Crime Laboratory contamination log. Now, let's have a look at the PCR procedure itself. It looks complex, but in actual fact, it is relatively straightforward. Now, we know that DNA is normally a double-stranded molecule. The very first thing we need to do in a PCR is that we need to separate the two DNA strands. We need to denature the template DNA. And scientists normally use heat to separate the two DNA strands. The next step is a critical one. Now, once the DNA strands have been separated, we add special and specific DNA primers. 
shown here in red. The DNA primers bind on either side of a specific sequence that we want to amplify up. And in this case, that sequence is known as a short tandem repeat. And I discussed this in one of my earlier videos. Now the primers, they bind on either side of the STR sequence. One primer binds to one strand, the other primer binds to the other strand. In essence, the primers flank the STR sequence that we want to amplify up. In the next step, we add a special enzyme known as a DNA polymerase. What that enzyme does is it extends from each of the primers. So you are forming new DNA molecules. And notice the DNA is extended in both directions. Now, after just one round of PCR, we end up with two new double-stranded DNA molecules. And as you can see, the STR sequence has been copied. So now we have two copies of it. All we need to do is to repeat this entire process between 20 to 30 times or cycles, and we end up with a massive degree of amplification. Now note, all of these reactions take place in a small tube known as an Eppendorf tube. Okay, now we discuss the PCR procedure. However, there are many places where DNA contamination can take place. And if you're working in a forensic laboratory, you need to be especially careful. Let's have a look at where some of these forms of contaminations can take place. Firstly, when you collect a forensic specimen, you can potentially contaminate the swab. The solutions that you use for a PCR can become contaminated as well. The laboratory bench is a very big source of contamination and shown here in the red circle is a centrifuge machine that's used to spin down the tubes that you use for PCR. You can also potentially contaminate your samples from the machinery. Now, as scientists, we, of course, try to clean up the area as best that we can. However, you cannot completely rule out contamination. However, the greatest source of contamination is the pipetting step. So you can easily contaminate your tip and you can contaminate your tube. You can add, accidentally add your own DNA, someone else's DNA, without you knowing it. But my favorite form of contamination is this one here. This is where you literally scratch your head and you have no idea where the DNA source had come from. You develop a profile that does not even belong to the case. It's completely unknown. And as a consequence, these forms of contaminations, they are rare, but they do take place. So here's the dilemma. PCR's greatest strength is also its greatest weakness, sensitivity. All you need is one cell one drop of blood, one hair, and if it gets anywhere inside that PCR tube, you will also amplify that DNA as well. Okay, but we don't really need to worry about that. And the reason why we don't is because we use experimental controls. Experimental controls are absolutely fundamental and essential to monitor for potential contamination. Things can go wrong in a laboratory. But I like to mention this. This is indeed very bizarre.
and this occurred very early on in the investigation you can see the date 11th of the 11th 05 and what had happened was special investigator Tom Fassbender who was the one of the lead investigators in, in the uh, trials he phoned up the head of the DNA unit Cherie Cohen and she noted down tried to put her in his garage uh, I'll, I'll read that again try to put her in his house or garage now I don't know about you but since when does the lead investigator in the case phones up the head of the DNA unit and asks for this type of request this is clearly unprofessional and should and both of them should have been sanctioned for that all right now, Cherie Cohen had eventually uh, got access to item FL and she was able to develop a DNA profile. Now, note, two of the loci did not uh, give full profiles. Basically, the DNA peaks were too low to count and she recorded this. But there's no questions that the DNA profile on item FL was from Teresa Holbach. Now, item FL was found on March the 2nd. It arrived in the laboratory on March the 16th, and it was tested by Cherie on March the 29th. So there is quite a lot of lag between when it was found to when it was tested. I also want you to note that Cherie Cohen had also isolated Teresa Horbach's DNA previously. She had isolated DNA from Teresa Horbach's pap smear, as well as several items that were found in, the, in her RAF4. So there is the possibility of Teresa Horbach's DNA being in the laboratory. But something unbelievable happened in the analysis of item FL. And that was Cherie Cohen had contaminated the PCR negative control. And she was questioned about this during the trial. She was asked, what did that mean? Answer, that means that during the extraction procedure, I inadvertently introduced my own DNA into the negative control. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, a manipulation control or a negative control should have no added template DNA in it. It should not produce a PCR product. If in actual fact it does, then that's an indication that contamination has occurred. But that's not a problem. Because what one does is you discard the results, you redo the experiment, you use a fresh control and reagents. And of course, one of the final things you do is you record that contamination into a log. So therefore, you could go back and examine what had occurred in the experiment, what went wrong, and what you did to rectify it. However, Cherie Cohen had requested a deviation form shown right here and note the date 041006 and this is the Stephen Avery case. It has a specific number. This particular uh, deviation request form was not signed until three days later. Now, you have to write a reason why you are requesting a deviation form and it's definitely worth reading out i quote normally the sample would be re-extracted but in this case there is no sample to re-extract according to our current protocol this sample would be only used for exclusionary purposes however in this case the presence of my DNA in the manipulation control 
does not interfere with the interpretation of the profile from sample FL. Therefore, I propose a deviation from the protocol allowing me to use sample FL for inclusionary purposes. All right, so let's examine this. Cherie Cohen stated that she needed to re-extract the sample, but the big issue here was that there was no sample to re-extract. Furthermore, if you get this type of result, you can only use it for exclusionary purposes. Cherie Cohen wanted to use it for inclusionary purposes. She wanted to state that item FL had Teresa Hallback's DNA on it. But interestingly, the actual deviation request form was not signed by Cohen's supervisor, Marie Variali. In fact, it was signed three days later by Gretchen de Groot, who is from another laboratory from the Milwaukee laboratory. Furthermore, this was the very first time that Cherie Cohen had ever requested this form. Let's have a look at trial exhi exhibit 314. There is a line in there that says, the manipulation control extracted with the bullet fragment, item FL, contains DNA that is consistent with this analysis. Now, if you had no idea what that meant, you would have no idea the significance of that statement. There is no explanation of its significance. That is that the manipulation control had contamination and there was no mention in the report. Now, these are the reports that are given to the attorneys and to the judge. There was no mention that a deviation request form was in actual fact required for item FL. She was quizzed about this. Let's have a look. Question. Anyone reading this report, this is the report on the left-hand side, would never know that in order for you to make that call and say that that's Teresa Horbuck's DNA, you had to do something you have never done in your career as a crime lab analyst, right? Answer, without discovery, no. So in other words, if the attorneys, if the defense never dived into the documents, they would have never found out the fact that a deviation request form was required in order to make this call about item FL. All right, let's have a look at the Wisconsin Crime Laboratory Contamination Log. Now, what happens, what normally happens, when a contamination event occurs, you write it in a log. So therefore, uh, someone can check if uh, a contamination event has occurred in the laboratory and what you have done. Now note, the contamination that Cherie Cohen had was uh, placed in the log dated 4-2406. She signed it and she stated what went wrong. She stated that her profile was found in the manipulation control. And we know that this is the Stephen Avery case because it has a specific case number. She wrote, the area was checked, no sample to re-extract, and she reported the profile. Now notice the dates that these uh, contamination events are placed in the contamination log. They appear to be in sequential order, except have a look at the last one. That's written as 43006, which is clearly not in sequential order. That tends to suggest that the DNA analysts in the crime laboratory do not write down the exact date the contamination event occurred. When they've got time, they then report it in the contamination log. Let's examine this. 
Cherie Cohane had received ITMFL on the 28th of the 3rd. She had processed ITMFL on the 29th, the day after. She requested a deviation form on the 4 10th 06 and it was signed three days later. She then reported the contamination on the 4 24 06. Clearly, she had reported the contamination event after she had requested the deviation form. And normally what one does is report the contamination first and then request the deviation form. So I have a feeling that the reason why it is out of sync uh, with when she obtained the contamination and when she reported it was probably due to uh, slackness on the part of Cherie Cohane. But she's not the only one because there are other analysts who clearly had reported their uh, contamination out of sync with the contamination log. Okay, now every laboratory has a manual and in that manual it goes through all the protocols and all the procedures and it discusses in detail what one must what one must do if both manipulation control or a negative control if something has gone wrong and let me read it out and this is from Cherie Cohane's own laboratory manual I'll read it I quote if in the allele typing areas a negative control exhibits identifiable alleles peaks greater than the analyst parameters not attributable to an artifact the DNA specimens amplified at the same time as the negative control will be considered inconclusive for match purposes. However, these specimens may be used for exclusionary purposes. It is written in black and white in her own laboratory manual. Now, of course, she was quizzed about this in the trial and have a read of her responses. Question. And it says it's got specific rules about what you can do when you get a contamination. Yes. And one of those rules in the protocol is if you get a contaminated control, it forbids you from making a call to include somebody as the person in that DNA, right? Yes. It tells you that if you go through these tests, and the manipulation control is contaminated, that you are to report it as inconclusive for matched purposes. Correct. I go on. Now here, you ran this test on the bullet and you got a result that shows the manipulation control was contaminated, right? Correct. And according to protocol, you should have not said that that was Teresa Horbuck's DNA on the bullet. Your protocol told you that you were to report it as inconclusive. Isn't that right? Yes. But if that happens, usually what you do is you try and re-extract it and run it again. Yes. But in this case, it was a one-time deal. You put that bullet into a buffer and you took whatever sample there was and you ran it off? Yes. So you could not redo the test. That's correct. Now, Attorney Buting, he summed up what had occurred perfectly. I quote, What you can't tell is when a piece of evidence shows up with someone's DNA. You can't tell whether it's there because it has been contaminated or not. And so what you do is you run a control. And the protocol says if that control is contaminated, you toss it out. And that's the end of it. Because they know from their own tests 
that there's cross-contamination that can occur from one evidence item to the next. And take note of this. And they can never rule it out if there's a contaminated control. So that was elegantly put. It means that if you have a contamination event in the laboratory, you cannot trust any result because contamination could have occurred in the test sample as well. Now, unbelievably, Attorney Garn um, made this response. This is in regards to the uh, contaminated evidence. He states, and I quote, So I respectfully ask the court to deny the defendant's motion to, to suppress that um, evidence for the stated reasons. Basically, nothing exculpatory was suppressed by the state. There's no evidence to test. There is evidence available to test, um, but the bullet likely has only inculpatory value. Um, now, take note what he says. They're welcome to retest the extract and share those results with us. We'll be more than happy to see it. Now, this is truly unbelievable when one considers the following. No scientist ever goes back to a sample that has been potentially contaminated or likely contain contamination. No one ever goes back to the PCR product, and in this case, from item FL. There's no point. If you retest a sample that is suspect contamination, of course you're going to get exactly the same result. What you normally do as a scientist is that you go back to the original DNA extract before you've done a PCR. There's one problem in this case though. There is no more DNA to retest. That's it. One time deal and it's suspect. So I have a few questions in regards to item FL, the bullet fragment which supposedly had Teresa Horbuck's DNA on it. If item FL went into Teresa Horbuck's skull causing the beveling that has been uh, uh, demonstrated by uh, Dr. Leslie Eisenberg, how did item FL end up on the floor of the garage? Right? Think about it. If it went into her skull, caused a beveling event, bone damage, how did it end up on the floor of the garage? That's impossible. Well, if item FL actually went through Teresa Horbuck's torso or body, why was there no blood or tissue noted on it? Think about a bullet going through your body. It's got to pass through layers of skin, fat, muscle, tissue, may even strike bone. Nothing was found on item FL when Cherie Cohane examined it. This one is a mystery. How did the searchers miss finding item FL and item FK in the many previous searches of the garage. Now, they're clearly looking for evidence. So how can the searchers fail to find two bullet fragments in the garage? Now, here's an interesting one. Why was item FL and item FK discovered after Brendan's so-called confession and only after the prompting by Wiegert and you can add Fassbender in there as well. Why did Special Agent Fassbender ask Cherie Cohane very early on in the investigation to try and put her in his garage, I apologize, try to put her in his house or garage? Why did he do this so early on in the investigation? And what does that do for fair forensic testing. Why did Cherie Cohane use up the entire DNA sample from item FL during the extraction procedure? 
no one uses up the entire DNA sample. It basically means that if something goes wrong in an experiment, you cannot go back to retest it. It also means that the defense cannot retest that sample either. Why didn't Cherie Cohane's own supervisor actually sign the deviation request form? It was signed by someone else three days later. Item FL was examined by uh, Kathleen Zellner's experts. They found no bone shards present in the bullet fragment. However, what they did find was the presence of wood shards and potential paint flecks in item FL. Now that's a rather bizarre finding considering the state are stating that this bullet went into Teresa Holbach's skull. And finally, and this is the one which I'm completely mystified, why was the DNA profile from item FL allowed to be admitted into evidence by the judge? I wonder whether he really understood the importance of good laboratory practice and the importance of controls. All right. Now, the Marlin Glenfield Model 60 rifle that was found in Stephen Avery's bedroom definitely had fired item FL. Let me quote. Question. All right. Is there, does that mean it could not have been fired from any other gun? It does. The opinion that exhibit 277 item designation FL was fired from exhibit 247 the Marlin Glenfield Model 60 .22 caliber rifle. Do you hold that opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? I do. The opinion that it could not have been fired from any other gun. Do you hold that opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? I do. So William Newhouse examined the bullet, examined the rifle. When a bullet is fired from a rifle, specific marks are placed on that bullet fragment. But here's the key question. Could that Marlin Glenfield Model 60 rifle have actually fired high velocity bullets? All right, now something unbelievable did not take place. And that is the chemical composition of item FL was not determined. I quote, okay, you were not given item FL to do any examination of? This is Kenneth Olson. No, I was not. So you didn't test the chemical composition of item FL? No, I did not. Take note of the following question. So you cannot say that the trace items of lead that you saw in either one of these two cranial fragments came from item FL. Isn't that right? That's correct. Now, you're probably thinking, what's the significance of this? It means that they cannot link item FL to the cranial bone fragments. They never tested the lead, the composition of item FL to see if it actually matched the lead that was found, as you can see, as tiny white flecks on the cranial bone fragments. I wonder why the state didn't test that. All right, let's have a look at a summary of the analysis of item FL. We know that a Marlin Glenfield Model 60 rifle was recovered from Stephen Avery's bedroom. From Brendan Dassey's confession, this eventually led to the discovery of item FL and also item FK. We know that William Newhouse showed that that specific rifle had fired item FL. There's no dispute. 
We also know that Cherie Cohen was able to obtain a DNA profile of Teresa Holbach found on item FL. However, Cherie had contaminated the PCR manipulation control and furthermore, she could not redo the test. Dr. Eisenberg had examined the cranial bone fragments and determined the presence of internal beveling and through the use of x-rays, she was able to note radiopaque particles. Kenneth Olsen was able to determine that those particles had shown trace elemental lead, obviously from a bullet. However, Kenneth Olsen could not link or did not test for a link between the bullet and the cranial fragments. However, Kathleen Zellner's experts, they examine item FL using a scanning microscope. What they found was there were no bone shards that were present. One of her experts had done test firing of 0.22 bullets into bone fragments, about the thickness of a human skull. In all cases, those uh, the uh, bullet fragments showed the presence of bone shards. The bone shards had embedded in the lead of the bullet. Zellner's experts found no bone shards in item FL. It probably explains why they didn't want to do a detailed chemical analysis of item FL. That's the state. But they did find the presence of wood fragments and also potentially red paint flecks. Now what is interesting is that the actual owner of the rifle, he stated in court in, uh, during uh, when he was questioned in court that he had fired about over 2,000 rounds some of which were near the actual garage because apparently there was a go couple of gopher holes that he had shot at so what is the possibility that item FL was actually shot by the actual owner of the gun and that the bullet had gone through the garage hit the wood and landed where it did so i like to conclude my presentation today having a look at all the evidence that has been presented both from a forensic viewpoint looking at the cranial bones from a, a dna viewpoint looking at how sheree cohane had um, tested item fl here are my conclusions there's absolutely no evidence that item FL had struck and went through Teresa Holbach's skull. None. Also, Cherie Cohen could not conclude that item FL contained Teresa Holbach's DNA based on the contamination present in the manipulation control. Now, based on her own documentation, in her laboratory, she was actually required to re-extract the DNA sample and redo the PCR. Unfortunately, she had used up all the DNA when she did the original PCR. That, from a scientific viewpoint, is absurd and unforgivable. Now, during this presentation, I've used and referred to original documents that, um, if you wish, uh, you can go and check up. And of course, I'd like to thank Rubber Ducky and all her fellow duckies for her support and their support for excellent discussion and for being so passionate in this case. Remember, we need to focus we need to put the heat on the state and expose what they have done wrong. And clearly in this case, in the examination of, of, of item FL, the wrong conclusions were made with this particular item. Thank you very much for your support. I hope that you have enjoyed the presentation. Many thanks.